from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to speak about a blind man in the Bible that came in contact with Jesus. It's found in the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. The 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. Beginning with verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. And he said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garments, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I may receive my sight. But there are many people today that are just like that. I read the other day that there are 42 million people in the world who are blind. Health authorities estimate that from all causes, half a million children become irreversibly blind around the world each year. And this is a great tragedy, and many people and countries and health agencies are working to turn it around. A tragedy of equal or greater proportion, though, is the spiritual blindness that people have. Because the Bible says you have two sets of eyes. You have physical eyes in which you can see, and you have spiritual eyes. And you can see physically, but you may not be able to see spiritually. And spiritual blindness affects everyone in this audience. There are thousands of people here tonight that you can see me up here, but you are spiritually blind. And it's a blindness that keeps you from really knowing God. Now, Bartimaeus was a blind man. And he came out of the, the little place where he had spent the night. And he never had any hope that he'd ever be able to see. And he would go outside the gate of Jericho and he would beg from the people that passed by. People on the way to market or people coming to their business that day. And he would say, help the blind, help the blind, help the blind, help the blind. He had his cane. He had an old shaggy coat. He had begged some bread from a woman as he had gone on his way and he got some milk. And there he sat with other blind people and other beggars. And they were begging, hoping that the people would throw them a little bit of money or give them something. And so I look at Bartimaeus and I see myself or I see you. The Bible says he is blind spiritually. And our world leaders are groping. I listen to some of these things on television from some of our world leaders, and I'm amazed at the spiritual blindness. And I have talked to some of them privately, and, and I, I just, I, I want to reach over and grab them and shake them and tell them that they need Christ because Christ could go open their eyes. And I think only the, the true believers really know what's wrong with the world because what's wrong with the world is a spiritual problem. Now this Bartimaeus could not see his rags, he couldn't see his filth, he couldn't see even beauty. And from time to time we read of someone living in a house or apartment that's filled with empty containers and refuse and garbage. And the person living there may appear to lead a perfectly normal life. And they're well dressed. I know a home like that right now where the lady is well dressed. Uh, the husband is, is a doctor and they are respectable. They're fine people. And when you see them out, you, you think they're the most wonderful couple in the world. But if you ever get into their house, it is a mess. It looks like a hog pen. And that's the way it is with so many of us. We appear all right on the outside, but down in our hearts and in our souls, we know that something is wrong. And for some reason, the person doesn't seem to even care. The scripture says, but the natural man, that's the ordinary man, the man before he comes to Christ, 
receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And it seems foolish for me to stand here and tell you that because Jesus Christ died on a cross 2,000 years ago and rose from the dead, that that can have an impact on your life today and now and give you assurance and peace and joy that you never knew before and help settle many of the problems and relationships that you face and give you a burden for your fellow man. But it's true. And some people would call that foolish. The Bible says that the pro proclamation of the gospel is foolishness to them that perish. You see, you are blinded by the God of this world. Now, who is the God of this world? Jesus called him the devil, the prince and power of the air, the prince of this world. There's another force in the world. And that other force has supernatural power too, and that other force is the devil. And there is a conflict going on, the conflict of the ages between the forces of God and the forces of the devil. You say, why does God allow that? That is a great mystery. It's a mystery as to where the devil came from. Now the Bible tells us in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. It also tells us in the 14th chapter of, of Isaiah. We get a little picture of it and we get other pictures and glimpses throughout scripture. But there is a devil. Now he's, he doesn't rule in hell. He's never been to hell. He's alive. He settled on this planet. Now you can call evil anything you want to, but we all know that there's evil in the world. And we all know that something is wrong, but we don't know what. Now the Bible tells us that back of it all is the devil. You say, but why doesn't God kill the devil and get it all over with? Well, someday God is going to do just that. He's not going to kill him. He's going to throw him into the lake of fire. But that day hasn't come yet. But the devil has already suffered a great defeat. And there's been a great victory by God at the cross. The cross looked like a defeat for God, but it was actually a defeat for the devil. And you and I can enter into the victory that Christ won at the cross when we come to know him. But till then, the God of this world has blinded our eyes, so our eyes are supernaturally blinded. And that's why only the Holy Spirit can lift those blindfolds that are on your eyes just now. He was not only blind, this man, but he was poor. And we read about the poverty in the world today, and it breaks our hearts. Many of us are suffering tonight from spiritual poverty. And then this man was not only blind and poor, but he was helpless. Bartimaeus expected to die in his blindness. No one could heal that kind of blindness. But there was a ray of hope to Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus had heard many rumors of this stranger from Galilee that was going up and down the country healing people and helping people and preaching to people. And he heard the approach of a great crowd of people. His ears were very keen and he could hear them. He heard the children. He heard the people talking among themselves. And he said, what's going on? What's going on? Nobody would tell him and the crowd was getting closer and closer. And he grabbed the skirt of a fellow that was passing by and he said, tell me, who is this passing through town? And this stranger that no one knows his name turned and said, Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And Bartimaeus thought to himself, Jesus of Nazareth, I've heard about him. I've heard that he can heal people, that he can help people. Maybe he could help me. You know, there only comes a few times in our lives when Jesus of Nazareth passes by and we have an opportunity like we have tonight to receive him. You see, people have been praying and the Holy Spirit has been working and many people have already received Christ. And what an hour and what a moment for you to come. This stranger gave him the message, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. I remember the story of the Surgeon General of Portugal, a former Surgeon General. And he was walking down the street one day and a piece of paper stuck to his foot. He went home, he pulled it off of his shoe and looked at it. It was a gospel tract and he decided to read it and he read it. And to make a long story short, he was converted to Christ and became a great Christian leader and a great Bible teacher. Just a simple little witness like that. God can use all of those things and that's why we ought to always be faithful in our witness because you never know when that waitress in the restaurant or that person that you meet at your work They'll watch your life, of course, to see if you're backing it up 
by the way you live. Jesus has been passing by in Hamilton. Jesus has been passing by in the Golden Horseshoe. He may be passing by in your home. He may be passing by in the room that you occupy at a hotel. He's passing by here in Southern Ontario. And in desperation, Bartimaeus cried at the top of his voice, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. And the other beggars said, close your mouth, close your mouth. The magistrates will hear about this and they'll come and put us in prison. But he kept on crying out. This was his one moment. This was his one chance. Jesus was there and he was going to take advantage of it. And the others said, keep still, Bartimaeus. Who wants to hear anything from a poor old beggar like you? But the more they rebuked him, the more he cried out. And I want you to notice several things about it. First, he cried for the right thing. He cried for mercy. He needed other things. But the thing that he needed most of all was Christ. He needed God. Have mercy upon me, you son of David. Have mercy upon me. That's what we all need tonight is God's mercy. Mercy. When I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, I'm not going to say, Lord, uh, I want justice. If I get justice, I'm going to end up in hell. I want mercy. And God has offered his mercy from the cross. And he says, I will forgive you and cleanse you from every sin that you've ever committed. You'll never have to face the judgment. You will never be in danger of hell if you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And so you have to say, first of all, I am a sinner. You have to say that to yourself and maybe to others. Just like an alcoholic. Before you can help an alcoholic, you, they have to be willing to say, I'm an alcoholic. Before you can help in drug addiction, you have to say, I am a drug addict. I need help. And when you come to Christ, you must say, I am a sinner. I need help. And oh, Lord God, please help me. And then the second thing, not only did he cry for the right thing, but he cried to the right person. He cried to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the only one in all the world that could help him, stood right there. And all of his hopes were centered in him. The Bible says none other name is given among men whereby we must be saved except through the name of Jesus. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And this man, Bartimaeus, was coming in the right way. He was coming to the right person. He was coming to Jesus, the Son of God. And he cried at the right time. Jesus was passing by. Suppose he had waited and said, I'm going to see what the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders have to say about him. I'll wait till he comes to Jericho again. Jesus never came to Jericho again. He may never come in this way again like this. When will we ever see a sight like this in Hamilton again? It's been a long time since this many people came and heard the gospel and so many people worked and prayed and believed as they've done here. And the church is united and cooperated as they've done. And God has been speaking and many people have been finding Christ and tonight you can find Christ. No, he called. At that moment, the Bible says, He that hardened his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. In other words, when you hear the gospel and do nothing about it, it hardens your heart a little bit more. But God, the Holy Spirit, will continue to speak to you, but you can't hear him because you get deaf. The Bible says, He from his joint to his idols, let him alone. There comes a point. I don't know where it is or when it is, but there's a point beyond which you can go. That your heart is so hard that even though God will still speak, you cannot hear. So come now while you have a, an opportunity. The great governor Felix was trembled when Paul was speaking to him about the gospel. And he said, go your way, Paul. When I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you. But he never had a more convenient season. That was his moment. That was his hour before God, and he didn't take advantage of it. The Bible says, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. There may never be a tomorrow for you. This may be the moment for you. He that hardened his heck neck, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off. 
Notice how Jesus met his need. Here was a great crowd of people, and we have a, a way today that we think in terms of great crowds. There's a great crowd here tonight, 18,000 people, I'm told. And we think in terms of crowds. We think in terms of filling out churches and filling an auditorium or having a big crowd at a ball game. We think in terms of crowds. But it's interesting, not only did Jesus preach to the crowds, but the greatest sermons I think he ever preached were to individuals. He stopped and stood still when this blind man called him. A great crowd of leaders were around him. He could have said, I don't have time. I'm on my way to Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world. But he stopped on his way to the cross to hear this beggar's cry. He stopped dying on the cross in order to hear that thief say, Remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. He stopped when a woman touched his garment. And Jesus will stop for you tonight. Because you see, he sees you tonight as though you're the only person in all the world. He doesn't see you as a part of this great crowd. He sees you as you are. He knows all of your thoughts and all of your intents and all the struggles that's going on inside of you. And the Bible says he loves you and he died for you. And if you had been the only one in the whole world, he would have died for you. And Jesus not only stopped, but he said, call him. The scripture says in Luke 19, 10, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. You're lost psychologically, spiritually. You're lost. You need somebody to find you and put their arms around you. That's what he'll do for you tonight. And there was a surprise on the face of the people in the crowd to call that poor old blind beggar filthy and dirty. The first time anyone, I suppose, had ever called him. Someone threw his cloak about him. Someone gave him his cane. He threw them both away and came running and fell down before Jesus. And Jesus asked him a strange question. He'd been blind all these years, and Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Can you imagine that? What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord. And that word Lord means that at that moment he had received Christ into his heart. My very own Lord, that I might receive my sight. And I think he was talking not only about his physical eyes, but his spiritual eyes as well. Scientists believe that 33 million of the 42 million blind people in the world either can be cured or their blindness could have been prevented. Spiritual blindness cannot be prevented. It's caused by sin and we all have it. But it can be cured by the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll open your eyes and he can open your eyes tonight. What is your need? What do you want Christ to do for you tonight? What do you want me to do, he said. Some of you say, I want him to forgive my sin. I want him to give me assurance and so that I can know that if I died at this moment, I'd go to heaven. I want peace. I'd like to rededicate my life. I've been baptized or I've been confirmed, but somehow I don't have that personal relationship with Christ and I don't have that walk with him that I ought to have and I'd like to have that. And so I'd like to reconfirm my confirmation vows, whatever it is. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Not money, not good works, but your faith has made you whole. Last December, an 18-year-old student pilot named Kim was making a solo flight cross-country when she became lost in a storm. She couldn't see anything out the windshield of her small plane. She didn't know where she was or how to get out of the storm and back to the safety. Something had gone wrong with one of her instruments. So she reached for her radio and made contact with a local air traffic controller, and she said, I don't know where I am. I need some help. Please, please help me. The controller located her on his radar screen and began talking her down toward a nearby airport where the weather was good. She couldn't see a thing, but he could see her on the radar. He knew where she was, which direction she was headed, where she needed to go, and the best way to get there. She trusted her life to a man she had never seen, whose name she did not know, and he got her out of the storm and safely to ground. Tonight, 
You can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never seen him with your naked eye. You may not know him, but he's there waiting for you with open arms to help you. So I'm asking you to quit flying blind. Trust yourself to Jesus Christ. Follow the guidance of his instruments, which is the word of God, the Bible. And then the scripture says, and immediately, immediately he received his sight. For some people, it's that quick. For other people, it's a period of time in which you're convicted of the Spirit of God and you grow gradually into the knowledge. But there comes a moment when you make that step from death to life, from darkness to light. I'm asking you to take that step tonight. And if you have any doubts about it in your heart, make your commitment tonight. Did you know that each night we've been here, we've seen more than 700 people both nights, each night come to Christ and come and make a commitment? And what I'm going to ask you to do is what we've done all over Latin America, all over Europe, all over the Orient, all over America, all across Canada. We've asked people to get up out of their seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say, by coming, symbolically, I need Christ. I want his mercy. I want his love and his grace. I want to know him for myself. Why do I ask you to come forward and make that a public declaration? Because Jesus hung on the cross publicly for you. He didn't do it in private. He did it publicly. And people were against him, sneering at him. He was naked and bleeding. And he did it publicly. And he said, that if we're not willing to confess him publicly before men, he will not confess us before his Father, which is in heaven. It's a public commitment. And I'm going to ask you to make that commitment tonight. And after you've all come and stand here, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some, a book that you can take home with you to help you in your Christian growth. And if you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. If you're in a bus, they'll wait. And you people in the other auditorium or the other room that could not get in here, you can get up and come and the ushers will let you in this building so that you can join those that are going to come. And from the balcony, it's taking a little bit longer than I thought the first night. It's going to take at least three minutes for you to come. So get up and start now. But don't let a little bit of time keep you back and don't let the big crowd keep you back. You just get up and come because it's you before God tonight the most important commitment that you have ever... Pick up the phone and call. If you call and it's busy, call again. Now the 24th chapter of Joshua. Joshua, as you know, was a great military leader. And he took the place of Moses when Moses went to be with the Lord. And the 15th verse. Now he had called all the leaders of Israel together at a place called Shechem. And he's getting ready to die. And this is his farewell address. And during this address, he warns the people about their idolatry. He warns them that the judgments of God will fall upon them unless they live for the Lord. And here's what he says. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. If you want to serve the devil, serve him. But make a choice. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But then he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua said, if every one of you serves other idols and other gods, makes no difference. As for me and my house, we've already made a decision. We are going to serve the Lord. And that's a decision that every single person here tonight has to make. You either have to decide that you're going to serve the gods of materialism all around us or the true and the living God. And Joshua was warning the people to choose God, to follow him instead of these other gods. And so we have to make a choice. Moses had warned Israel much earlier, a generation earlier, when he was dying. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've said before you life and death, blessing and cursing, 
Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Moses had said the same thing that Joshua is saying, separated by many years, and every generation has to hear it over and over and over again. And that's why the gospel never grows old. It applies to every generation alike. We have to make a choice. Alexander the Great was asked how he conquered the world. He said, by not wavering. And James says in the first chapter, he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. He said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Are you unstable about your relationship to Christ? Do you waver in your relationship to Christ? Or are you totally committed to Christ as Savior and Lord? Or do you waver about it? Many of you waver by the way you live. And Jesus warned the hypocrites, people who pretend one thing and live another. This was his great battle with the hypocrites in the church. We have old proverbs that are familiar to us all. He who hesitates is lost. Procrastination is the thief of time. A stitch in time saves nine. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Don't waver. Make a decision. Do it now. That's what Joshua was saying. And Joshua, the great military hero that had led them from victory to victory, reminded them of all the victories that God had given. And he said, serve God and live. Serve these other gods and you'll die and come under the judgment of God. And the message has not changed. Now the wars were over, but Joshua found that the people were going toward idolatry. And many times the problems of peace are greater than the problems of war. And he had called all these leaders to Shechem. Now Shechem was a place, the most historical place in all of Israel at that time, and still is today. It was where Abraham had first settled when he left Ur of the Chaldees. It was where Jacob had purchased his parcel of land. It was where the bones of Joseph had been buried when they were brought up from Egypt. And so he has, there are two mountains there. I've stood there. And on one mountain he put six of the tribes and on the other mountain he put the other six. And Joshua spoke with a mighty voice, even though he was an old man. And he reviews the history of Israel and how God had blessed them. And how they had won their victories, not by their own power and their own strategies and their own ingenuity and their own strength, but by the power of God. And the people should have been grateful to God, but instead they were now going to other gods. And we in America should be grateful to God for the blessings He's given us. But what do we find? We find that we're worshiping other gods, the gods of pleasure. The gods of lust and greed and hate. The gods of materialism. Even the gods of war. And Joshua tells them that such a condition cannot continue. They must decide whether they want to serve the idols or to serve the living God. And he will not allow any neutrality. Neither does Jesus Christ. And Joshua said, you have to decide immediately now. Choose you this day, not tomorrow, this day, whom you're going to serve. And many of you are going to have to decide tonight. What is the number one priority in your life? Is the priority Christ? Or is the priority something else? Christ demands first place. There's no room on the throne of your heart for two gods. It's either Christ or it's the other God. Because I believe the emphasis must, we must lay it out straight that you cannot serve God and mammon. You must make a choice. And I found that the harder the challenge is, the greater the response. Young people today want a challenge. They want something tough and hard, all right? Give your life to Christ. He'll challenge you because he says you must deny self and take up a cross. He says, I'm going to a place of execution. Come and go with me. Deny your own selfish ambitions and lust and turn to me and go to the cross with me.
Now, Paul taught that a Christian is someone who has turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. There's a film showing throughout the world this year called The Idol Maker, but a Christian is an idol breaker. And regardless of their decision, Joshua said, it's for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. You know, Adam and Eve had to make a choice in the Garden of Eden. God said, if you want to build a wonderful world, we'll build it together. But I'm going to test you because I've given to you the ability to choose. I haven't made you a robot in which I could punch a button and you would obey me. I've made you in my image. You have the right to choose. So when Adam and Eve faced that choice, they chose wrongly. They broke the law of God. And God said, in the day that you do, you will suffer and die. And man has been suffering ever since. And it's all because of that first sin in the Garden of Eden. And man has been inheriting that tendency to sin ever since. The seed of sin is in us when we're born. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Think of it now. At conception, sin was already planned. And then comes the age of accountability, moral accountability, maybe eight or nine or 10 years of age, when you are held accountable by God for your actions and you choose to sin. And then the rest of your life, you practice sin. You're born towards sin. You choose to sin at a certain point, And then you practice sin. And the Bible says we have all sinned and we're all idolaters. Now, Adam had to make a choice and he made the wrong choice. You have to make a choice. Many of you that are watching by television, I hope that you'll use that telephone number right now and call in and make the choice for Christ and say to that counselor, as for me in my house, I choose the Lord. And then many choices, like the rich young ruler. Remember he came to Jesus and he was filled with questions and he wanted eternal life and he said, Sir, what must I do to find eternal life? And Jesus said, looked at him and loved him and said, go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Take up the cross. Follow me. The young man was grieved. He wept. He wanted Christ. But he wanted his money more. Now, if he had said, all right, I'll do it, Lord, I'm sure the Lord would have said, no, it's not your money I want. I want your heart. It's our attitude toward these idols and toward the, these things. The television itself can become an idol. When we walk into the room, all conversation stops and we sort of sit there in reverence watching that box to see if J.R. is going to be shot again. Now, the Bible says we must choose two ways of life. Jeremiah had written, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. There's a way of life, there's a way of death. Which way are you on? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. I'm the only way. I'm the only way to permanent peace. I'm the only way to permanent joy. I'm the only way to eternal life. I'm the only way to forgiveness of sin. I'm the only way to the Father. You have to come by me. And that eliminates a lot of people. When Jesus began to talk about dying on the cross, a lot of his followers left him. They said, Lord, we thought you were going to sit up on a big throne and we were going to drive in Cadillacs and we were going to have beautiful swimming pools and lovely ladies and all the rest of it. We didn't really know that you were going to die and wanted us to go with you. We thought this was going to be a kingdom and we were going to overthrow Rome and we were going to rule the world. And that is going to happen someday. But not now, the cross before the crown. Some of us want the crown before the cross. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. 
What are some of the ways? Well, some people say, I'm going to follow my conscience, but you don't follow your conscience. Many of us have dead consciences. Your conscience is no longer a safe guide. You've hardened it, you've deadened it. And then other people say, well, I try to be sincere in everything I do. We're, we're here on a football stadium right here. And many years ago, I saw a man pick up a football and he ran 65 yards the wrong way. Now, he was one of the most sincere fellows you ever saw. <laughs> Lost the game. And then there are many people that say, well, you know, I do a lot of good works and I give money to charitable causes and I, I do all that. I, I'm sure God will understand. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved, through faith, not, not that not of yourselves, but the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if you could work your way to heaven and pay your way to heaven, you'd get up and say, look what I did. I got myself here by my own good works. The only way you're ever going to make it is to come to that cross where Christ took our sins and our judgment and our hell and identify ourselves with him. And then there are some people that say, well, I'll reform, I, I'll do better. I know people that are always saying, I'm going to do better, but they never do better. They don't have any power within them to do better until they come to Christ. And when you come to Christ, an explosion takes place of power that he gives you to live a new life. I can't live the Christian life. I have no power within me to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit has to live in me and Christ has to live through me. I cannot live the Christian life. I'm a total flop and failure. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Few, he said, only a few are going to find that narrow gate and that narrow way, as I said last evening. Are you among that few? You not only choose between two ways of life, but you choose between two masters. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism, he says in Matthew the sixth chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. You have to make a choice. All the way through the Bible, choices, 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 choices. Not only between two ways of life and two masters, but you're going to have to choose between two fathers. Two spiritual fathers. He said in John 8 a very shocking statement. The 44th verse. He said, you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. Now, he says, for many of you, the devil is your spiritual father. Now, you're not aware of it. You wouldn't admit it, but that's the way God looks at it. There's either God, your spiritual father, the true and the living God, Christ, or there is the devil. And then you have to choose not only between two ways of life and two masters and two fathers, but you have to choose between two destinies, heaven or hell. Solomon wrote about the way to hell in Proverbs 7, 27. C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge and Oxford professor, he taught at both universities, used to emphasize, he said, no one ever had so much to say about the way to hell as did Jesus Christ. On the other hand, no one ever spoke of heaven with more clarity and authority as Jesus Christ. And one of the most played pop songs is the Led Zeppelin Stairway to Heaven. Jesus Christ is the stairway to heaven. He is the way to heaven. Come to him. And if you want to come to him, pick up that telephone if you're watching and call that counselor who's waiting to talk to you about the way to heaven and how you can find Christ. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Yes, Jesus is in heaven preparing your estate right now. 
waiting for you. There is a future life. And eternal life does not begin when you die and go to heaven. It begins here and now when you make this choice for Christ. Because eternity, eternal life comes to dwell in your heart tonight. Jesus Christ is the gateway to heaven. Now this choice also, you must make yourself. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Your father can't make it for you. Your mother can't make it for you. Your children can't make it for you. This is where you must choose yourself. He knew that he could not choose for the tribes of Israel. They must choose for themselves. Man is a social being. However, there's an inner sanctuary within ourselves where we retire from all other fellowships, comradeships, and influences, and there's a lonely arena where the greatest battles of life must be fought alone. And this is a decision that you have to make alone. Moses said, I call heaven and earth to record this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that thou and thy seed may live forever. Notice it says thy seed. This has something to do with your children and your grandchildren and your children's children. My son and I were talking tonight about how it passes on from generation to generation, this faith that we have in Christ. The writer to Hebrews recounts how Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He made a choice. Moses could have probably been the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter, heir to all the riches and power of Egypt. And he made a choice to suffer persecution and the reproach with the people of God. He didn't know that his name would be in history. He didn't know that someday he would lead all of Israel. He didn't know that someday he would be considered one of the greatest men that ever lived. When he made that choice, he made it on the basis of simple faith in God. Some think that Guy Lafler is the world's greatest hockey player. And he said a month ago that each of us has only one past, but there are many futures. You see, you can't change your past, but you can determine your destiny by deciding for Christ. And when you do that, Christ changes your past. He wipes out all the sins of the past. Because you see, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses it from all sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. When He died on that cross, He forgave all the past. You tonight are reminded of the many sins in your life. The Holy Spirit's bring them to your mind right now. And you know they stand against you at the judgment where every secret thing will be brought out. But Jesus tonight offers forgiveness. But he offers more than forgiveness. He offers justification. Just as though you had never committed a sin. What a wonderful thing to go to bed tonight and know that the past is gone. Forgiven. Cleansed. And God no longer remembers your sins. Yes. And this choice is very urgent. To delay makes the right decision harder. Indecision is itself a choice. Not to decide is to decide not to. Choose now. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise a tomorrow. Come while you can. Time itself makes the decision for you if you don't. You say, but what do I have to do? Three things. You must be willing to repent of your sin. That means to change your way of thinking about your sins and realize how bad they are in the sight of God. Change your way you're thinking about God and say, I love him and I'm going to love him with all my heart, mind, and soul. I'm going to make him the priority of my life. I'm going to put him first from now on. He's going to be not only my savior, but my Lord. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of any church. You may be a officer in the church but you're not sure about your relationship with Christ and you want to be sure 
and you must be willing to repent. And secondly, by faith, receive Christ into your heart. That means you put your whole weight on him and trust him and him alone. And thirdly, you follow and serve him as his disciple and follower and obey him. That means a big change for many of you if you make this choice. I'm going to ask you to make it now. And I'm going to ask you to do it publicly as we've seen thousands of people this week already come to Christ. I'm going to ask you to get up from your seat. If you start from that top stand up there, it'll take you two minutes, so start now. And come and stand in front of this platform. And as you all stand here in front of the platform, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature and you can go back and join your friends. You're making that choice by coming and standing here. And the reason I do it publicly is because every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. Joshua called upon the people publicly. Moses called upon the people publicly to inscribe their commitment that would be seen publicly for generations to come. I'm asking you tonight to publicly and openly come and say tonight, Christ is going to be priority in my life. I want to know that I have eternal life. And you that have been watching by television, pick up the telephone and call that number. There are people standing by to talk to you right now. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. watching by television can see that here in this stadium at San Jose University in California that hundreds of people are coming to make their commitment to Christ. Pick up the phone. You see on your screen, you dial that number and if you don't get in right away, keep calling. They'll be there all evening and make your commitment to Christ over the telephone or ask the counselor to ask, answer your questions. God help you to make that commitment. And please go to church next Sunday. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, 